Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. I'm Mark Sennett. I'm the CEO of Western Business Media, the publisher of Health and Safety Matters. We're delighted that this podcast is once again sponsored by the Health and Safety event. And that takes place on the 27th to 29th of April 2021 at the NEC in Birmingham. And if you want to find out more information about the Health and Safety event or to register for your free pass, because of course it also gives you access to the facilities event, the fire safety event, main tech, the emergency services show and the security event, all you have to do is go to www.healthandsafetyevent.com. Now, if you want to find out the latest news in the health and safety sector, you need to go to the HSM website, which is www.hsmsearch.com. And we have all the latest news, prosecutions, products, and feature-length articles. And you can, of course, register for free to receive a printed copy of HSM, which comes out six times a year. Or you might like to receive our twice-a-week e-newsletter. So again, that's free to sign up. Just go to all of that to www.hsmsearch.com. But while we're talking about news, that's obviously how we always start off the podcast. And this week, obviously, we've got plenty of news to cover. And we're going to start off, which probably won't be a surprise to anybody, on the news that just keeps on going at the moment. And that focuses all around COVID-19 and the effects that's having on our industry. So the main story I've got for you this week is something that the BBC broke, which was that 50 million NHS masks are wasted. Safety concerns have been raised that the use of 50 million face masks, which were bought by the government in April for use in the NHS, are actually being wasted. The ear loop fastening masks are said to not fit as tightly as those with a head loop. The £252 million contract, which was for Ayanda Capital to supply the Department of Health and Social Care with two types of face masks, which includes the FFP2 respirator masks. To ensure that the mask is effective, a tight seal between the mask and the wearer's face is required. And to achieve this, the wearer needs to undergo a face fit test. Alan Murray, who, as you all know well, has been a guest on this podcast in the past and is the chief executive of the BSIF, which is the British Safety Minister's Federation, he was actually interviewed by the BBC. And it's great to see that the BBC actually finally went to the British Safety Minister's Federation for comment and he said the face fit is either a pass or a fail and there are more fails on this product with ear loops than there are on products with head harnesses. That means that it wouldn't necessarily provide the protection that was required from it. It's reported that 150 million type IIR masks that were also supplied by Ender Capital are unaffected. So yeah obviously this is an expensive issue and that's a huge amount of masks to be wasted. What I would say on this is Alan Murray and the BSIF have worked tirelessly since this pandemic has come out to carrying on the work that they always do, which is to ensure that PPE must fit and you can go to the fit to fit scheme that they have to make sure that your PPE is compliant. But they've also spent a lot of time saying that you should only use adequate PPE. And the biggest concern I know for the BSAF at the moment is the amount of PPE that's not compliant that's flooding the market. We had a webinar, which I'd urge you to go back and listen to with Alan Murray a couple of months back about ensuring that PPE is compliant. And you, and you can listen to that and you can get CPD, actually, if you listen to it. Just go to hsmsearch.com and click on the webinars tab and go down to the BSIF webinar. And Alan just gave out a shocking statistic that just in China alone, since the start of the year, 20,000 companies have opened up with the word mask in their name. The biggest concern now, and if you listen to our previous podcast, is that non-compliant PPE is flooding the market. We'll be speaking to Resmar and Able Safety later on in this podcast, and I'll say the amount of people that are just doing additional size of their businesses so they could be a manufacturer of clothing, and they suddenly decide they want to create a face mask and put it on the market, and it's just not compliant. And it's great to see that Alan, who I know from speaking to him, as I, as I always do, this is really, really concerning the BSIF, and... It's good to see that they've had at least some national media coverage on this. But as we stay on the topic, and we move to say face coverings now, there's actually a new BSI kite mark for face coverings. So as face coverings are becoming increasingly part of everyday life, BSI has launched a BSI kite mark for face coverings. The new kite mark assesses face coverings to a technical specification that requires 70% particle filtration and breathability tests to ensure 
consumer comfort while reducing the risk of the spread of the infection. Face coverings differ from PPE and the medical grade face masks in that they are intended to protect those in close proximity to the wearer, not the wearer themselves. While a vast number of face coverings are already available on the market, their performance and design may differ significantly, and as we just said, they certainly do. On top of breathability and filtering, the new BSI Kite Mark for face coverings provides independent approval of the quality of the fitting, and the instructions provide the wearer to minimise the chances of transmission. Howard Kerr, who's the chief executive of BSI, has actually commented on this. He said, There's an overwhelming choice of face coverings available on the market. The challenge is knowing which claims that they make are valid and whether they provide a basic level of protection to others. Face coverings that are independently assessed to schemes such as the Kite Mark will allow consumers to make an informed and trusted decision. And it's worth me just interjecting here of saying the Kite Mark is the level, the top, the gold standard. You know if you've got a Kite Mark that the product is up to scratch and meets the relevant standards for the market. And a lot of and all the major manufacturers, whether you look at JSP, etc., they can form the Kite Mark and they're passionate about it. And if we go back to the BSAF, they're passionate about making sure that products are kite marked as well. So UK manufacturers, Cookson and Clegg and Rotherham are amongst the first organisations to be in the final stages of the assessment to achieve the BSI kite mark of face coverings. It is expected that the first face coverings with a kite mark will be available from around about the start of this month. Even though more than 100 years the kite mark's been going, it continues to be the beacon of quality, as I said, and performance and safety to both consumers and businesses, buying everything from fridging, which is all the way to secure digital services. Like all BSI kite mark schemes, a new face covering will be tested on an ongoing basis to ensure that the manufactured products continue to meet the necessary requirements year after year in order to be trusted. So a closing comment from Howard Kerr is, he's concluded that as we continue to pull together as a country to combat the impacts of COVID-19, it's important that we also take appropriate measures to protect one another. While face coverings can never provide the full level of personal protection such as PPE or medical grade face masks, it's neither necessary nor appropriate for such products to be diverted to general consumer use, providing consumers with confidence that their face covering provides some level of protection for those around them and reduces open the spread of virus while we emerge from lockdown. You can find out more about this new scheme, you just have to visit bsigroup.com. But I think one of the key learnings there is this myth that some people think that face coverings will just stop the transmission of COVID-19. As you can see, they're not designed for that. They are intended to protect those who are in close proximity to you, not protect you. The only thing that would properly protect anybody from that is proper PPE, a proper fitted mask that is aimed um, from the PPE side rather than a face covering. There, there's a big, big difference there. And you know, that's something that you really need to be aware of. So don't just presume that wearing a face covering is going to protect you. It'll protect others, but it won't protect you from getting COVID-19. So at this point, I want to step away from the news for a moment and introduce our first guest. Our first guest this week is Robert Leach. Rob is the Product Development Director at Airsweb, and in fact, he founded the company in 1999. He's had a big couple of weeks, actually, because Airsweb actually just got sold a couple of weeks ago, which is something that we will go into. But before I introduce Robert, it's worth saying that we did a brilliant webinar with Airsweb that you can listen to on demand, and you can get a CPD points if you listen to it on demand. Again, if you want to go and listen to it, you just go to www.hsmsearch.com. Dot com, click on the webinars tab and you'll see the title of it, which was EHS Frictionless Reporting to Manage Incident Reporting. It took place on the 30th of July, but as I said, it is available now. In this webinar, which was sponsored by Airsweb and delivered by Rob, we shared an insight into the barriers of reporting health and safety instances near misses or major incidents. These barriers can include communication, tools, understanding, attitudes and even fear. But more positively, how leveraging digital technology can remove reporting barriers like this. So I sat down with Rob earlier in the week and here's what he had to say. Morning Rob, how are you? I'm good Mark, nice to speak to you. Yeah, good to speak to you again. Obviously we had a busy week last week. You and I delivered the latest Health and Safety Matters webinar. Would you be able to tell those people that missed it 
what we covered. Wow, what did they miss? Of course, Mark, yeah. Um, the main focus of sort of last week's uh, webinar was frictionless reporting and the ability to break down the barriers to allow people to re report any type of event, whether that's a near miss, a near hit, a close call, you know, using technology to uh, leverage people to, to be able to just report incidents very quickly, very easily in that frictionless environment. And we, we quickly went over four or five different types of technology from mobile web apps and progressive web apps, how they are very easy and quick for people to report. And then we touched on things like WhatsApp, and social media, how again, it's everyone, everybody's phone, everybody's used to using it. We touched on the old school sort of SMS and emails because they're still there and still, you know, if you can email in an incident, it's very easy to do. And then finally, we sort of touched on, on a bit of the future with MS Teams. You know, resistance is futile. We're all using MS Teams. So why not use it to report unwanted events through? And then finally, we touched on a dash cam. You know, driving is the most risky thing we all do. So why not have your dash cam reporting events that happen to you on the road automatically and safely? So lots of technology, even though we only focused on five sort of things, just to show how we could break those barriers down for people. Well, you covered on to the point that I want to come on to next. One of the aspects that you covered was artificial intelligence. How is digital technology removing barriers caused by things such as artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think, Mark, that is a big one, that the artificial intelligence. You know, from we've come a long way from computers playing chess against people, uh, mimicking that sort of artificial intelligence. Nowadays, it's in everything. You probably even don't know the, the piece of software or the piece of technology you're using has got artificial intelligence in. So why not leverage it in the, um, you know, the health, safety, and environmental space? And that's what we did at AirsWeb. We looked at artificial intelligence some years ago, and as it's grown and progressed through natural language processing as well, you know, you could talk to it, your Siri's and Alexa's. We latched onto that as well. And, and it is actually a enabler. It opens the door, artificial intelligence, to all these other ideas. So behind the WhatsApp, behind SMS, behind our email, even behind MS Teams, we have our virtual assistant using artificial intelligence. And that opens the door to all these other different types of technology just because we're going through a virtual assistant based on artificial intelligence. It, it is definitely here now, but it's going to get better and better and better. And, and companies need to, you know, you need to start leveraging that straight away and, and keep going with it. Innovation is so important on this subject. Now, before I go on to my next question, for those of you that haven't seen the webinar, you can watch it on demand and you can still get CPD for watching it. All you need to do is go to the Health and Safety Matters website, which is www.hsmsearch.com and there's a webinars tab in the top navigation. Click on that and that'll take you straight through to all of our past webinars and the Airs Web one. We will send you a CPD certificate for attending that. But let's, let's turn our attention back on to grilling you, Rob. If you look ahead, to, and it's difficult to do so in the current environment, but what do you think the biggest challenges facing the sector are over the next 12 months and also your business? Well, obviously, we can't it, it sort of um, have that conversation without talking about COVID, the impact that's had on the world that right the way around in every industry, in your home lives. I think we, we reacted to that very quickly as a company um, and provided some services around that to, to try and uh, help our client base from, you know, we've got a, a little system that you can ask a question and it will search all the government health websites to give you some answers back, little questions and answer type service we've got right the way through from allowing clients to quickly assess the impact of COVID by allowing people to report quickly isolations or suspected cases. And it can feed back to the organization, you know, the type of thing you can have a problem with this type of skill because a lot of people think that they've got sickness in this area. So, I, I think in our small way, we did try to help our, our clients, you know, uh, get over this this hump and hopefully it doesn't come again. But um, it, it allows them to track that and the impact through their organization. And I think it's not going to go away. You know, um, I, I think that'll be with us now for probably another 12 months at least. And who knows what will spin off the back of this. So I think COVID was a was a key thing that's happened to all organizations. Hence the frictionless. You no, know, you really need people to report these things quickly. And when we look at what your business does, innovation seems to be an important part of your business. Can you tell us a bit more about how innovation plays such a key role at AirsWeb? Absolutely, Mark. 
I think innovation, probably three or four years ago, as a company, we, we, we pushed it into our DNA, literally. We, we make sure we think innovatively right across our business, whether you're in production or design or implementation. We, we really look at any ideas um, that people bring to us. You know, we've been recognised by Vedantics as being very, innovation is, is our key thing. And as I say, it's in every aspect of our, our business. And that comes back to our webinar was about leveraging technology. It's the same thing. We looked at these, we looked at WhatsApp probably two years ago. We looked at artificial intelligence and the vir virtual assistant probably three, four years ago when we used voice commands. We really did uh, use innovation to try and help our, 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 our clients actually break down those barriers for reporting. But it comes into everything. We've even got it in, we re-architected Ava completely over the last five years. And even the underlying databases now, we use te technology in there. You know, we use a graph database. We use lots of different ideas in everything we do. So I believe you've got a case study on a graph database technology that you can share with us. Would you give us an insight into that, please, Rob? Yeah, the, the graph database is, is a key technology within Ava. It, it allows us, it's sort of a... How do I explain that nice and easy for everybody? But it's sort of like a schemaless database. It's, you know, it looks after the relationships of all your data, which allows you to analyze a lot quicker and a lot easier, tell you things you didn't know. That's what we tell our people. So Vedantics highlighted this and, and did a white paper uh, working with us just to show how graph could, can really um, expand the usage of your product and allow things that you didn't think were possible before more than anything. So yeah, graph is a is a, a big building block for us on, for the innovation side, and the, the white paper is available from the Dantics. So obviously, you personally and your organisation Airsweb has had a rather interesting week. You were required last week. Can you tell us a bit more about what that means for you, what it means for the company, and what we can expect next from Airsweb? Yeah, Mark, I, I can't get more topical than that for me at the moment. So if, yeah, we, we're required by Eco Online. It's a perfect match, Mark. It really is. You know. Um, we took a long time to, to, to find the perfect sort of partner and we think EcoOnline are. They, they're, they're a big organisation. It gives us the power to grow. You know, our products are complementary and very much now we can offer a lot more to our clients and will do going forward. It gives us the edge. It really does. I think you'll see lots of things happening from EcoOnline and Airsweb moving forward. And if people want to find out more about Airsweb, what's the easiest way for them to get in touch and to do so? Well, there is the website. You know, that's the easiest way to go on there. And you can, you can put a sort of reach out in there and contact us via the website. Well, obviously, there's, there's the Dantics always has news about us and what we're doing and the white papers. So, yeah, they're probably the easiest ways to get information from us. Well, Rob, I wish you all the best with the takeover. Thank you for delivering such a great webinar last week. And we'd certainly urge everybody to go to the HSM website and listen to that on demand. As I said, www.hsmsearch.com and click on the webinars tab. As always, Rob, great to speak to you. Thanks for joining us today. Mark, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Now, returning to the news, some big news coming out of the health and safety executive as Sarah Newton has been appointed as the new chair of the HSC. The Department for Work and Pensions has appointed Sarah Newton as the chair of the health and safety executive board. The appointment started from the 1st of August and is a five-year posting. She will replace Martin Temple at the conclusion of his term. Sarah has 30 years experience of strategic planning, leadership and change management and has dealt with complex issues across businesses, the voluntary and government sectors. She has considerable experience of building partnerships between diverse people and organisations to deliver shared aims. She served a wide range of boards and is currently a non-executive director of the Royal Cornwall Hospital NHS Trust. Between 2010 and 2019, she was also an MP and served three years as the member of Science and Technology Select Committee before becoming a minister in the Home Office and latterly the Department of Work and Pensions, where she had the honour of working with the HSC and leading the Health at Work Unit. Amongst other responsibilities while the Home Office, she led work on tackling modern slavery, human trafficking and human exploitation. Before entering the Commons, she was also Director of the International Longevity Centre UK, Age Concern England and American Express Europe. She also served as a councillor in the London Borough of Merton. Secretary of State 
for Working Pension Industries of Coffee said, I'm pleased to welcome Sarah to this important role and look forward to working with her. Her insight and experience will be a huge asset as we work safely to resume everyday life across the country, helping to build confidence within the business and workers as we get Britain back to work. I would also like to thank Martin for his dedication throughout his service over the last five years. So commenting on her appointment, Sarah Newton said, as we move out of the nationwide lockdown and learn to live with COVID-19, the role of the HSC has become more critical. I'm looking forward to working with the HSC non-executive and executive leadership teams and tackling the challenges, building on the strengths of the organisation and working in partnership with employers, unions, trade associations, professional bodies, academics and other in, to enable Great Britain to work safely and well. Well, obviously, we wish Sarah all the best in her post over the next five years. It is a key position. And you know, there was some good news coming out of the HSE that I reported a couple of podcasts ago that actually there's a record low number of workplace fatalities. This continues to drop. I mean, as I said on the podcast a couple of editions ago, it was roughly at the same level, but it had dropped by a, f- a few. But as I also said on that podcast, no workplace fatalities are acceptable. Everyone has the right to come from home from work safely. And it is, though, good news that these figures continue to decrease and have done for over a decade now. So that was the good news that came out of the HSC. And of course, you know, it's good news that they acted quickly to get a new chair of the HSC in place. And as I said, we wish Sarah all the best in her role. And we work closely with the HSC at HSM. They done articles for us they've been part of our podcasts they've been part of our webinar series and as i said before you can go to our website and listen to the last couple of 3m webinars where we had hse guests on there and you will get cpd for listening to those so again just go to hsmsearch.com and listen back to it and we'll send you a cpd certificate so i want to finish off the news by some news from us actually So, as you may have seen, the Safety and Health Excellence Awards due to COVID-19 have had to move date once again. The date now is the 24th of November, and the SHE Awards will take place as expected, as planned, at the Vox in Birmingham. It's a fantastic venue. It is the industry's biggest networking event, and we had, gosh, over 200 entries this year. We've got a fantastic shortlist, which you can see on our website, which is www she-awards.com the categories are there for all to see campaign of the year best health and safety project the alan MacArthur unsung hero award best health and safety manufacturing best health and safety in construction the health and safety manager of the year the health and safety team of the year hsm rising star innovation of the year for fire the safe logistics award is a new one and the lifetime achievement awards you know we're delighted to bring these awards in partnership with the bsif and our headline sponsor this year which is Lyrico. So we hope as many of you as possible will join us. We're taking all the necessary steps to make sure the event is properly distanced and safe. And as I said, it will take place on the 24th of November. And if you want to buy tickets, they're £199 for one ticket or £1,800 for a table of 10. You get a three-course meal. There's lots of entertainment there. We've got arcade games. We've got magicians, we've got a drinks reception, but we have had to change the host for this year because we were going to have Hugh Dennis, but unfortunately Hugh isn't available. So we've gone with the very well-known impressionist Alistair McGowan. And there'll also be a band on at the end. So a very serious message to it because the awards are all there to recognise the excellence that you guys deliver, whether it be products or teams, really championing everything that's great and good about the health and safety sector because far too often it's maligned. And you do a really, really key job of keeping people and premises safe. So it really does celebrate excellence. That's the name, the Safety and Health Excellence Awards. And we hope as many of you will join us as possible. And we wish everyone that was shortlisted the very best of luck. And a huge thanks to our huge esteemed panel of judges. It's not me and it's not Kelly Rose, the editor, that picks the winners of these. It is industry figureheads. We've got it, and you can see who our judges were. It was from IOSH and Nibosh. And there was a great, great list of people that were involved in it. So it very much is independent, the judging. So please do consider coming to join us. And as I said, you can get all the more information on this on www.she, which is S-H-E hyphen awards dot com. So that rounds off the news this week. So I want to finish up, as we always do, with an interview with a manufacturer. But actually, we haven't just got one, we've got two 
This week we're joined by both Resmar and Able Safety, that's Nigel Stubbs and Peter Barco. You know, they're a great company, they're sister companies, Resmar and Able Safety. And we really went into detail, Pete, Nigel and I, in terms of their concerns for the health and safety market in the wake of COVID-19 and how they're doing everything that they can do to make sure that quality products are in the market. So I sat down with Peter and Nigel in the week and here's what they had to say. <music> Morning, Nigel and Peter. How are you both? Good morning. You're all good, thank you. You? All good. Are you with us, Pete? Yeah, I'm here. Good to see you. Yeah, always good to see you guys. Obviously, we've known each other a fair while now, and you guys are always around on the exhibition circuit, out and about at events, and we always talk about what's going on in the sector. So I thought getting your opinion on how Resmar and Able, your business, is going, and then ask you some wider questions as well today. So let's just start off. Nigel, can I ask you to tell us a bit more about Able Safety, if people aren't familiar with it. And I'll ask the same question about Resmar over to Pete. So Nigel, could you tell us a bit more about Able, please? We've been going since 2010. Uh, and if anybody doesn't know, we specialise in confined space safety equipment. So all aspects of gas detection, breathing apparatus, working at height equipment, rescue equipment. We sell it, we hire it, and we service it from some of the major manufacturers in the industry, like sort of Crocon and Globestock, people like that. Yeah, so... That's basically what we're doing in a nutshell. And Pete, can you tell us a bit more about Resmar, please? Yeah, well, Resmar has been going since about 1992. We've started off doing security and then safety, selling PPE and stuff like that to the industry. Over the few years, we've expanded. We're Prager, Scott, 3M. Most of the big manufacturers we supply, we sell, we service, and we hire the same as Nigel. Um, we've got a team of service engineers all over the UK, and all uh, our engineers travel all over the world doing the marine side of it as well. So we'll come back to your companies in a minute, but I just want to talk about the current situation that we're all facing at the moment. Obviously, COVID-19 has yep. had an impact on everything. Now, when we've been talking off air, Nigel, you and I in particular, you've expressed concerns about the amount of dodgy PPE that's coming to the market, non-compliant PPE. Can I ask you first, just give more of an insight on what your concerns are on that and what could be done? I think one of the major concerns is since the start of the COVID uh, pandemic, and people will probably back me up on this as well, is that the amount of companies and forgetting where it's coming from and the manufacturers who are manufacturing them is the amount of companies within the UK that have gone from doing their bread and butter everyday sales or services to, to the industry. So you got, you're getting people that are into like printing T-shirts, stationery, that are suddenly becoming PPE experts and selling masks. And to quote our MD, Mr. Bob Barco, is why buy something off someone who's been doing it for 30 seconds when you can buy it off someone who's been doing it for 30 years? It, you go to the right people to buy the right product. And that's one of my biggest concerns that people aren't. And we're seeing more and more of it coming. Yeah, if I throw that back to Pete a second to get your take on it, and also throw in a sub-question to that, what do you think needs to be done to prevent that? Is it an education thing? Is it something the BSIF need to keep working on? Or HSE? I think the BSIF have been doing a brilliant job on it because they've been helping us to try and crack down on it. But the industry in general is just wrong. You can sell PPE without a license or without an approval. And it's just got to a point where I've, I'm stopping selling normal FFP2, P3 masks because I can't get them in the volume we need. But the price has gone down or up depending on what they want. The KN95 filters are flooding the market and the HSE is saying they're not the right mask to be used. No, you're right, Nigel, they're not complying. That is exactly what the HSE came out in a press statement and said. And, you know, we, we were talking before this interview started about how we were coping all within our businesses. And, and, I, and I'll throw that back to both of you. If we start with Nigel first, how has COVID-19 affected your business? Have you had supply chain issues? How have you coped? Going back, yeah, especially on the mask situation, on gloves, anything to do with COVID-19, um, getting hold of anything. So obviously the NHS has become priority, which is brilliant, and it's the way it should be. But for the day-to-day -day companies out there, getting hold of equipment to protect themselves against COVID-19 has been extremely, extremely difficult. And we have found that. So it's, it's almost, your bread and butter stuff is almost, it's not taking a, a side, 
you know, it's not taking a step backwards, really. It's it's just become not important to anyone because everyone's so forward thinking about COVID-19 and how to combat it and how to protect themselves against it. That's all everybody thinks about when you speak to them. And it's Pete, slowly becoming better now. And but, Pete, yeah. what about what about you? How, how have you coped on the Resmar side, supply chain and, and general as a business? It's been really hard finding masks. We're I understand why all the manufacturers are supporting the NHS and the frontline staff, but they forget you've got the manufacturers that produce our food. They have to wear masks. There's so many of my customers have been at the brink of closing down, stop producing food because they've not been able to get simple PPE. Yeah. You can kind of almost understand, like Peter just said there, is people are on the, on the verge of shutting their businesses. And you can, almost, you can almost understand why they're getting a substandard product. Because if it's the only thing that's available to them, what you it's either buy it or they shut down. But it still doesn't make it right. It's still how are they getting into the country is half the battle, and how are people actually physically allowed to sell them? And that's been the problem. I guess this brings us nicely back to, to your businesses, and we'll start with with Pete on this. What has Resmar had out new products wise in the last you know year to eighteen months? What new have you brought to market? Well, we've not really brought anything new. We've, we've started selling a lot more um, height safety equipment, so gantries and stuff like that from Reed Safety. Um, it's just expanding the products that we do. So as the manufacturers produce new products or develop them, we're, we're at the front line of selling it. And Nigel, what about you over with Able Safety? Have you had anything new out in the last 18 months? A um, couple of new... I won't say new products, but a couple of new interesting um, ideas along that. Crocon have brought out something they call Crocon Connect, which is basically it's a cloud-based data storage, which any gas monitor that you connect to it, it downloads whose user it is, it downloads alarms, if it's gone into alarm, any errors on it, So, uh, which is where everyone seems to be going. Globestock have got a couple of new products out, got a great new tripod out in three different sizes with a tri-head on it. Um, so yeah, there's a few products out there, but I think everyone's just been concentrating on the wrong side of the businesses, if I'm honest. <laughs> well, the natural follow-up question for me to you, Nige, then is, have you got anything interesting in the pipeline? What's what's next for Able Safety? Next for Able Safety? It's a big question. We are wanting to push the higher side of the business more. Me personally, I believe that people, especially the cost side of things, it will save people a lot more money if they went down the higher side, because we can you do higher contracts where you can have a 12 month higher contract, which includes service and maintenance, everything in it, it kind of cuts out the initial outlay of the cost of buying the products. Yeah. So that's where I'm wanting to push the business a hell of a lot more within the next sort of 12 to 18 months. And obviously you're a sister business, uh, Pete, uh, and a Resmar. So what's next for you guys? Well, we're getting more engineers trained, so we want to expand our servicing side, on-site servicing, so not just send it back to a workshop. So we want to get more contracts on-site, dealing with the airport, stuff like that. More of the industrial fire brigades as well. So if people want to get in touch with you, Nigel, and find out more about Able Safety, what's the best way they could do that? They can either give us a call. Are we allowed to advertise our phone number? You are allowed to advertise your phone number and the web address. (laughs) I'm going to test you if you know your own contact details. Um, you can give us a call. It's 0161-336-4195. And we, myself and Pete, are a big advocate of information is free. We're happy to talk to anybody. We're happy to go and see anybody. We're happy to go and give advice on anything that we know about. And if we don't know about it, 99% of the time we can find someone that does. Also, go to our websites, able-safety.co.uk as well. Ours is currently under construction, but we're getting there slowly. And Peter, to finish off, if people want to find out more about Resmar, how can they get in touch with you or what's the website to go to? Oh, well, our website's at resmar-safety.co.uk and the best thing to do is give us a call on 0345 803 3399. Well, brilliant, boys. It's always great to catch up with you guys. Thank you no, for good giving... to see you, Matt. Yeah, I hope we'll see you in person soon enough and thank you for your insight that you gave us on... It's, it's a real serious concern of, of everybody's right now about dodgy PP flood in the market. So yeah. I hope business continues to go well and I'll see you soon, I hope. Cheers, Mark. Appreciate it. Cheers, Mark. Thanks. Now that's all we've got time for on this edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. My thanks to 
Rob, Nigel and Pete for joining us as our guests this week. And we'll be back in a fortnight's time. Always come out on a Monday every fortnight. And please do share this podcast with your friends and industry colleagues. As you know, it's completely free to download. Please give us a positive review, which can be on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify. But if you can't wait two weeks for the latest news, we have it out daily. You can go to the Health and Safety Matters website, which is www.hsmsearch.com. And that website offers so much more than news. It gives you the opportunity to listen to all of our back archive of podcasts, but it also gives you the ability to listen to our webinar series where you can get CPD points I've mentioned throughout this podcast. Just go to www.hsmsearch.com and look at the webinars tab in the primary navigation. You can also sign up to receive Health and Safety Matters magazine six times a year, or you can sign up to get our twice a week e-newsletter completely for free by going to our website. Our thanks as always to our sponsor, the Health and Safety Event, which as I said at the start, now takes place on the 27th to 29th of April 2021 at the NEC in Birmingham. And if you want more information on the Health and Safety Event, you can register for a pass that will get you free access to that event event but also to the security event the facilities event the fire safety event main tech and now the emergency services show and all you need to do is visit www.healthandsafetyevent.com so our thanks to all the participants this week and our thanks to you and we'll see you in a fortnight's time on the next edition of the health and safety matters podcast (music) 